Okay, hopefully this doesn't cut slides off. Um, good morning, Commissioners, Director Burhans. Um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to come and talk to you all about uh, what's been going on with our forestry program um, for the last few years and, and what we're looking at doing going forward in the next few years. I titled this um, Growing and Regenerating as it kind of relates to what we're doing with our program as far as growing our personnel um, and uh, regenerating personnel. We're having staff turnovers and um, you're going to hear from one of our bright young field forestry staff later on today on a special project. Um, and also growing and regenerating the forest. We're getting a little more aggressive with what we've been doing out there on the game lands in our forest management program. So the first thing I always try to go over is uh, to make sure everybody understands what our program responsibilities are. Talk a little bit about the recent history, some accomplishments and trends that we're seeing, some new developments that we've undertaken, and of course, there's always challenges to be overcome with anything we're doing. Um, you're going to see a lot of things fly in here on the screen right now. Um, and when I put presentations like this together, sometimes I, I keep typing and I keep typing and I keep putting things on there and I think, man, this is got a lot on our plate. Um, not like any other program in the agency. Um, I heard a quote one time that said, we're, we're too darn small to be this big. <laughs> you know, we're kind of a small agency. We have small programmatic staffs accomplishing some really big things out there. So um, when you look at all the things we have going on in the program, you can see our forestry staff is not only involved in just timber sales, which is what everybody often looks at and thinks of, but um, we've got other non-commercial habitat improvement work going on, um, regeneration contracting with herbicide, deer aging, our field forestry staff is all, all participate with the biologists in the deer aging program every year. Um, prescribed fire, a lot of our forestry staff have taken leadership roles in helping grow the prescribed fire program on game lands. Our habitat health measurements, looking at deer browse impacts on game lands. Um, forest type mapping, which is the basis uh, um, of the GIS of our comprehensive plans. Um, special permits, we get involved with some things. Um, it, oddly enough, sometimes the smallest things take up the most time. Um, and, and permits are one of those issues. Forest pest management, um, which seems to be an ever-growing challenge, dealing with everything from the uh, ever-present gypsy moth problems to emerald ash borer and on now the spotted lantern flies, kind of the newest, latest, greatest thing we're hearing about. So um, that seems to be an onslaught that uh, has grown tremendously just in the 10 years I've been in this position. And it, it seems like every time we turn around, there's some new critter um, or disease uh, popping up. Um, forest inventory analysis. Um, a lot of the things I'm going to talk about today wouldn't be possible without having some great professional support staff here. Um, that are able to look at our data and, and conduct thoughtful analysis of it. I have Paul Lupo here today with me from my staff, um, and, and I wouldn't be able to pull together the kinds of numbers and the kinds of analytics that I'm going to show you without the great support staff we have. Um, and the Howard Nursery, of course. Um, many, many folks have heard that this year we're not doing a public seedling sale um, from our Howard Nursery. Um, we had a little bit of a, a crop failure and some germination problems with some species up there, but we're still putting seedlings out on game lands. We still have enough seedlings to uh, support the Seedlings for Schools program, um, and our hunter access cooperators will still be getting them. Um, but we hope to be back up and running with seedling sales next year. Um, but the Howard Nursery is still there, it's still functioning, and uh, still putting out good seedlings for great habitat. So down to the nitty gritty, what I, if we're going to talk about what we're doing with our forests, we should probably have a good understanding of what they look like first. Um, you're, you all know we have a little over a million and a half acres of game lands out there. A little over 1.3 million of that, almost 1.4, is what we consider forested in one way or another. Um, and a little over 900,000 of that acre, acreage um, is what we would consider multiple opportunity zoned. I'll get into that in a second. And when you, when you really get down to the nitty gritty looking at the forest types, the growing sites, the, the quality and the types of uh, timber we have out there, about 785,000 acres is what we would consider commercially manageable. Um, so that's about half, a little more than half. And that's not really too different from many of the other landowners in Pennsylvania, you look at DCNR, I would, I would uh, if you look at their management plan, their numbers are similar. Um, when they break down their land base and they look at sensitive areas and riparian buffer zones and all those kinds of things, it breaks down to a little more than half to somewhere around 60%. So that's, a, that's kind of a typical breakdown. And that's a, a quick shot of what a typical game lands map would look like for operability zoning. So anybody familiar with this game lands by shape? You can see right down through the middle of that game lands, we've got a stream corridor that we've zoned as a buffer. So you look at those different operational zones, you can see 
We have almost a million acres in what we call multiple use across the state, but we have riparian buffers that are designated. We also have what we call our limited use areas. In this map, they show up as a little bit of a yellow tint. Um, and that could be anything from perched water table soils that are not suitable for conventional management to severely steep slopes, severely rocky areas, things like that, where it's just not conventionally manageable. It doesn't mean we don't conduct management there. Um, we, we can still do lots of great habitat work in those areas, but it's just not something we would consider in that timber management kind of regime. Um, special use areas at 7,000 acres across the state. Um, that, that includes uh, things like orchards, food plots, herbaceous areas, critical wetland habitats, things like that. And uh, easements, 15,000 acres. This is, I put that, pulled those numbers from a couple data that's a couple years old. Um, that easement acreage seems to increase every once in a while. Every time we have um, somebody exercising their severed subsurface rights, oil and gas development that we don't control, um, we get a new pipeline, we get a new um, right of way of some sort, that gets classified under that easement area. Also, timber reservations would be under there. Um, in our last you know, 10 years of land acquisitions, much of the land that we acquired has a lot of the, the different reservations of timber rights. And so uh, we, we, we get the land, but we may not get the ability to manage the timber for 10, 15, 20 years sometimes. Um, but that's, it's not a huge proportion, but it's something worth noting. So what have we been doing with that land base? Um, Got some really good data going back to about 2002. So what this graph's gonna show you on the right hand side in the blue is acres. And this is the acreage that we've been annually offering for sale of commercial timber projects, going back to 2002. Accordingly, the value in red that has gone along with that acreage. Um, back around the early part of the millennia, we were rolling pretty good with timber prices. The housing economy was booming. People were building nice cherry cabinets. Um, and, and, you know, we could sell 5,000 acres of timber and generate 15, 16 million dollars out of that. Um, you can see there was a little bit of an indication along about 2005, 6 that there was maybe some impending volatility coming. And then in 2008, the bottom fell out. Um, and that followed the, the, the housing market. As you could imagine, people don't have the income anymore that they have. People are losing jobs. The housing market collapses. People aren't remodeling homes. Um, so things were, were pretty rough for a few years. But even with that said, with the, with the values being down here, you can see we were still holding steady with our production. And I, I make that point to say that our timber program is generated on acres of wildlife habitat. Quality wildlife habitat generated by good forestry practices. It, we don't negatively react and stop putting out timber because prices went down. Uh, private landowners have. And in that time period, private landowners severely restricted access to their timber. So we became even more important to the industry at that time that we were consistent in what we were doing. Um, and you can see since about 2011, something to note is the, the general trajectory of the red line follows the general trajectory of the blue bars. Um, and I like that because that shows some stability. It means that we're, we're increasing our value by increasing our output. Um, and as long as those two curves trend together, I like that. The big spike there in 2014, um, we got really lucky and hit a kind of a miracle market for ash. Um, the Chinese were really hungry for our ash timber at that time. And we were implementing our emerald ash, emerald, <laughs> emerald ash borer action plan. Say that five times fast. Um, and we were kind of full on looking for those areas on game really heavy to ash in our timber stands, trying to make sure we were managing those appropriately and ahead of the infestation to not only create better quality habitat, but take care of that resource and, and use that revenue. So we put out a lot of ash timber that year and the Chinese markets for it were through the roof. So that's why you see that big bump in price right there. Um, recently, I've seen, uh, you know, you probably all ask, well, what happened to black cherry? Black cherry was always the thing that was triple the value of the next closest species. Um, domestically, cherry markets have been in the tank since 2008. There's just not a, a high demand for it. Um, consumer trends have changed to painted cabinetry as opposed to dark wood cabinetry. Um, but what's happened just in the last couple months, again, our good friends, the Chinese, have really increased their demand. So cherry prices are starting to come back up again, and people actually want to go harvest cherry timber, which we have a lot of. Um, but it's 100% tied to exports. So there's there's problems there. Talk about that in the challenges at the end. A couple things to draw your attention to here though. 
you look at that 10-year av average of what we were accomplishing from 2002 to 2012 there, about 5,700 acres a year of timber we were putting out there. Um, there was a lot going on in that span as well. 2002 to 2004, we rotated a full 50% of our forestry staff. Um, we had a lot of retirements and a lot of new folks coming in. So you can imagine what that does when you already only have the limited staff we have. When you have that amount of turnover, it takes those young folks that are coming in a little bit of time to get up to speed, a little bit of time to learn their game plans, pick up the projects that were in place. Um, the other thing that started was along about 2006 was our comprehensive planning initiative. And the foresters had a big hand in that, remapping all the game lands, some that haven't been fully remapped and reassessed since the 70s. So we had a, a relatively new staff for a good long period of time, and we had saddled them with a lot of responsibility to get a lot of things done. So being able to stay consistent w was a good thing. Um, about 2011, you can see we started to pick up the pace, and I'll draw your attention to that trend over the last five or six years. Um, We've gotten the first round of comprehensive plans pretty well completed. Um, we've, we've transitioned our work effort back to some things on the ground, and we've been making big gains. We also added a few staff. Um, we added six forest technicians back in 2014, and you can see what that did in 2014, 15, 16. It really helped us increase our outputs. So it begs the question, if you look at that, well, what's our target? Where do we want to go? And what, what, what's our... What's our vision here for the future? Um, to understand that and how we arrive at that, talk a little bit about what our forests look like again with age class distribution. Um, on the left hand side you'll see there there's percentages and I'm just looking at that 785,000 acres of what we consider that commercially manageable land base with this slide. Um, if you look what it currently looks like right now, in, it's hard to see the bottom, but these are 20 year age class groups. So 0 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80. This is 80 to 100 year old. forest. Again, not unlike much of the rest of Pennsylvania and not unlike other public ownerships. Anybody familiar with what, what's been going on in a lot of the press about our forests? We have aging forests and we have not been able to keep up historically over the last 30 years with keeping those age classes balanced. Um, so we look a lot like the rest of the forests of Pennsylvania. If we keep doing that 5,000 acres a year of timbers harvest, this is what we'll look like 100 years from now. I think that's shocking and, you know, pull, pulls me back when I run those kind of models and say that's certainly not what anybody here is looking for. Not for um, what our future forest would look like and certainly not for wildlife and wildlife habitat. <coughs> Having less than 10%, you know, 5 6% of your forest in a 0 to 20 age class isn't what we want. What we want is something that looks a lot more like this. You know, having that youngest age class and more consistently distributed across the board, you know, that youngest age class, 0 to 20, somewhere in that 17% range. Now, mind you, that's only on what we consider our commercially viable forest land base. We've still got 700 and some thousand acres of other forest land that we're out there actively managing through other means, prescribed fire being probably the biggest one that's up and coming and growing. So also leveraging our Pittman-Robertson increased funds that we've had over the last several years to do more non-commercial forest management. Um, some of you have probably experienced some of those aspen cuts and things like that that our habitat management crews are out there doing. So if we could get 17% of our commercial forest land base into that category, you add what we're doing on non-commercial means and prescribed fire, and now we're tipping the scale up over that 20% number um, when you look at the game lands as a whole. That's the target. That's where we're trying to get to. So what do we have to do to get there? We've got to get our annual harvesting rates up somewhere between 12 and 13,000 acres a year. And that's inclusive of all commercial forest harvest types, whether it's shelter woods and improvement harvests to kind of get that regeneration started to, so that we can ensure we're sustaining the right types of forest that we want. Um, and then the rest in the regeneration, which is the final removal, that age class changing harvest. Um, and, and those are rough numbers. That, that ebbs and flows a little bit year to year. Some years maybe we could even be over 13,000 acres. Um, some years were a little less. Some years were heavier to regeneration. Some years were heavy to improvements. Um, some years we're into some salvage operations. Right now in the southeast part of the state, we're dealing with some uh, oak mortality, um, kind of widely scattered um, from multiple gypsy moth rounds of recent years, plus oak leaf roller and some just general oak dieback that we're finding. Um, uh, Two-line chestnut borer coming in and affecting it. So there's always those things we have to react to that'll cause a little bit of fluctuation in those numbers, but that's kind of the target range where we want to be. Um, and as you can see from that slide, you know, we, 
we're progressing. And, and um, none of this stuff is anything you can just flip a switch and start doing tomorrow. I think part of it, and I'll talk about it in the challenges a little more, is you almost have to be a little bit careful how much you do that you don't do too much too fast because there might not be the industry there to support it. Um, going along with that and ensuring we're doing good sustainable management, um, we've used a lot of herbicide out there to control undesirable vegetation. Um, there's a lot of you that are familiar with walking in the woods and seeing a sea of ferns in the understory or a sea of impenetrable beach brush, striped maple, things like that. It's really undesirable and choking out our ability to regenerate those forests. And again, here you can see our, our use of herbicides has grown to, you know, 6,000 plus, acre, well, just shy of 6,000 acres per year now. Um, and again, you can see that red line, that's the, the cost of that. Those, those curves trend together, which means our prices per unit area are staying pretty stable. Um, we've gotten pretty darn creative in the last few years of how we bid out these packages. And if you look at one of my herbicide bid packages that I get start getting phone calls about this time of year, um, the operators are like, wow, you've got this broke down into nine line items and we're awarding the bids by line items so that we can make sure we're getting a lot of different herbicide operators out there at the best price per acre to get it done in the shortest window possible. Um, so we're trying to find all the ways we can be efficient um, to get this work done. It's, it's critically important. Um, there's some areas, especially in our oak forests, where prescribed fire can kind of be a surrogate for um, herbicide use in a lot of ways. It can have some of the same effects. Um, we look at our northern hardwood forests, that's where we generally have a lot more problems with competing vegetation um, that we need herbicide to be able to affect. Something else I always get questions about, what are we doing with deer fencing? Um, in the last several years, we've really curtailed fence installation um, to where we haven't actually put out a contract for fence installation in the last several years. Um, we have been taking down more fences than we've put up now for several years in a row. Um, and we, but we still have areas that we have some high deer impacts. We have concentrations of, of deer, generally speaking, where we're doing active management. They love to come in and, and browse on that fresh regeneration. So we came up with the concept of trying to use hunters to, to give them a better experience, maybe dial them in a little more to places where we know there's a little bit de more dense deer population, um, give them a little bit better access by opening up some more roads and hopefully help um, decrease browse impacts. Um, we've had, I think it's, this was the third season we've been using that. Don't really have a lot of hard data and feedback, but we, we've gotten the social feedback has been pretty well received, um, probably three to one positive to negative comments. Ob obviously, there's those hunters that love to walk and hike back into those tough to get to areas and enjoy the solitude. And now all of a sudden we open up a road back there and they're going to be a little disgruntled for a little while, but uh, it's, a, it's always a trade-off. Can't make everybody happy all the time. Um, a little bit about actively what we're dealing with at any given time. Right now, as of last week, we have 105 open timber sale contracts across the state. So um, that's a pretty big load when you have all the payments coming in and contract paperwork going back and forth is a, is a pretty big administrative burden with that. Um, and under contract right now, we've got over 22,000 acres out there under commercial forest contracts. So there's a lot going on. $27 million on the books um, with only 36% of that in a receivable category right now. Um, a few years ago, my receivables were up above 50% of the contract values, which that gets me a little, ten a little tense. That means uh, operators aren't moving in there and paying their, paying their bills and, and cutting the timber. Um, so when I see that number get down there to around 36%, that's an indicator to me that the industry's healthy. We're selling timber. They're, they're going in paying for it and harvesting it on a, in a good pace. Um, and we've also got about $3.6 million worth of what we call in-kind service values on outstanding right now under contract. Um, I think that's something that sometimes is lost on folks that we get a heck of a lot of value out of our uh, forest management program on the game lands. When you look at roads, parking areas, bridges, culverts, gates, the reclamation seeding specifications that we have for wildlife habitat, herbaceous openings, things like that, there's a, there's a tremendous value in there that's, you know, we're not paying our people to do it. We're not paying operators to come in and put lime and fertilizer and seed down. So when you look at the value that we get every year in cash money to the game fund by selling timber, you kind of have to add that in-kind service annual value to that to get a true representation uh, of what we're capturing in value back to the agency with the program in addition to the habitat value, which is one of those things you just can't really put a number on. Um, I talked a little bit about the Emerald Ash Borer Action Plan. I'll just kind of 
touch on that briefly. We, we implemented an action plan in 2007, put it into our forestry manual, really started focusing on those game lands where we had stands that had greater than 30% volume in ash because we knew if we lost the ash out of those stands, that was going to change the ecological dynamic and, and create potentially a challenge for us to regenerate those stands to other healthy species. So we, we got pretty aggressive with some of those spots. We've done a lot of work. I'm proud to report that several of those are now are a few years post-harvest and they're looking really good as far as regeneration of desirable species. Um, we also have done some hazard mitigation work. Um, some of our game lands, particularly in the northern tier, that are heavier to ash volume, they have a lot of roads kind of in those creek valleys. You know, if you've been on game lands where roads kind of follow streams, well, what else follows streams? High quality soils, highly productive stands of, of timber, and generally that's where ash likes to grow. So we, we got to looking at some of those and uh, said, boy, we're gonna have a big problem on our hands if these ash trees start dying, falling over. Not only is it a hazard, but then we're putting our, our own habitat management crews in harm's way to go in there and cut those trees, clean them up. So we were able to conduct some local scale timber sales to just mark the ash trees within 100 feet of those roads through the corridor where the roads were and we, we sold those timber sales and they got knocked out really fast um, the industry was hungry for the timber when we were selling it and and proud to report those those projects have gone really well um, but it, we, we thought that was important when we started seeing the magnitude of the problem um, something else that i'm i'm really excited about um, and it seems like we've been progressing well, as long as i've been with the game commission now but we're finally, I think, into a program that's really going to change the way we do things on the ground. Um, in 2006, when we stood up the Comprehensive Management Planning Program, we instituted a GIS structure for, for putting all our spatial information into it. And one of the things we quickly noticed was we were capturing tabular data in databases, and we were capturing spatial data in GIS, geodatabases. And a problematic is trying to link those two things together and make those two databases talk to each other and make all that information sync up so that you can look at something spatially and understand the data behind it. So we launched into a partnership program. We put a contract out with Mason, Bruce, and Gerard Incorporated. They're out of uh, Oregon, actually. Um, but they're one of their principal folks is a former Penn State professor and Pennsylvania forestry guy. Um, so they have this program that they call their mobile map technology. And what it's done for us is allowed us to capture our timber harvest, timber stand data in a geospatial platform. So we no longer will have two separate things going on at once. It's all linked together um, from, from the get-go. Um, we've leveraged these um, Juniper Mesa tablet units. Um, they're about the size of an Amazon Kindle, a little thicker, a little heavier. They're really rugged. They can withstand, they can even work in the rain. A touch screen that works in the rain, believe it or not. This is like the cutting edge technology in um, ruggedized tablets. Oh. Um, so we're fielding those out with all our field forestry staff. And essentially what it's doing is at the end of the day, it's, it's less time at the desk and more time in the woods. And for, for our forestry program, when I talked about the, the staffing and the efficiency, efficiency for us is, is paramount. So if that forester can be out there in the woods, collects all his timber tally data or all his regeneration data right in that geospatial platform, jumps in his truck, gets to a Wi-Fi hotspot, bang, he uploads his data. By the time he gets back to his office, he just calls that up in his online system on his computer and he's got all the data right in there. <coughs> 15 years ago when I was a field forester, I was collecting everything on tally cards and then I would go back to my office on a rainy day and sit there and hand jam tally cards into an Excel spreadsheet. So what used to take me three to six hours now takes three to six minutes for these guys. So I'm really excited about this um, project. Um, this, this summer will be the full, first full field season of implementation. Um, but it's not without its glitches, but again, got good staff working on it. And talking about that staff briefly, we've got 40 full-time staff. 23 of them are field foresters. They've got over 60,000 acres of responsibility each. Um, if you look around at uh, that equivalency to you know, the Allegheny National Forest or DCNR or even private um, industrial forests, we're, we're managing sometimes twice as many acres per person as many of those areas. And I, and I can't say enough about the quality of our, our field staff out there. Um, our regional foresters and assistant regional foresters out there all making things work. 
Um, myself, two program specialists, one of those positions vacant right now, um, and one clerical person. I've got one clerical person. I share her with the engineering staff, and she handles every timber sale contract, every payment logged into the database, every letter that I have to send out. Um, so I can't say enough about how important she is to me um, back here in the headquarters element. Um, Part-time staff, like I said, 2014, we hired on six technicians. We spaced them, as you can see, across the northern regions, two, three, three. Well, no, that's, is that right? Three, two, it was two, two, and two across the northern regions. I don't know why I have three on there. Um, because that's where we have the biggest glut of our timber resource and where we have the biggest need to ramp up our efforts. Um, through some reassessment and, and uh, some strategy and planning with executive office and other staff, we're going to transition, and right now out there we're recruiting for 14 forest technicians. So when you look at the fact that we have 23 field foresters, we're going to have 14 technicians hopefully coming on this year um, to work nine-month seasonal positions. Um, we're going to scatter them all across the state. We're going to be placing some in the southern regions. Um, the southeast region was really hungry to get their hands on a couple technicians because they have been really active with prescribed fire um, and really active with timber management and forest management in the southeast. So they were, they were hungry to get, get a couple extra assets as well as a south central and a southwest. So um, we're, we're anxiously awaiting their, their arrival and start uh, to see what, how we can further you know, get towards that 12 to 13,000 acres a year. We've always got challenges. Now we're experiencing some of the worst markets for low grade and pulpwood that we have in my tenure here. Um, five years ago, I couldn't give pulpwood away fast enough. It, it, there was people hungry for huge volumes of, of low grade wood. Um, the markets are volatile. You have paper plants shutting down across the country every year now with the move to digital media and things like that. Um, you have a couple open winters where people aren't using firewood and pellets. Um, and when the high-grade lumber markets come up and people have a little more income, they're not going to use particle board fixtures. They're going to want solid cabinets. So some of those things kind of play against each other when you have better saw timber markets, the pulpwood markets kind of struggle. Um, but harvesting that material and, and, and is a challenge because that's how we set up our quality regeneration and get our desired habitat conditions. So we're actively engaged with the industry on a continuing basis to feel out what they need and, and find better ways to accomplish that task. And probably one of the biggest ones that's hitting us right now is the availability of logging workers. Um, in recent years, the labor force has moved to other industries with the spike in natural gas. Those jobs pay a lot better when you're working on a pipeline or where you, when you're working on a well pad than um, running a skitter for a logger. Um, and it's sometimes difficult to attract those, fellow, those folks because it's, logging's dangerous. And I, I didn't know this until I did a little homework. I always heard logging was like the second most dangerous profession. It's not. It's number one. As of 2016, um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, that's a pretty shocking number when you look at the fatalities per 100,000 workers. Commercial fishing, you know, who's ever seen the deadliest catch? You know, and you hear about all that every year. That's the, one of the most dangerous things. But look at the fatality rate per 100,000 workers of logging versus even commercial fishing. Um, it's just inherently dangerous. You're cutting big trees. You're using big equipment. Um, you know, we've, we've had our... On, on state game lands, we've had some severe injuries and even fatalities in the last few years. And it's, it's one of the hardest things that I deal with in my job. Um, but, you know, we participated in um, Governor Wolf's Green Ribbon Task Force on Forestry Conservation and Jobs um, last year. And this was one of the hot button topics was how do we continue to recruit a logging workforce out there to accomplish our needs? We had a, a timber sale we tried to bid in the northeast part of the state up in Wyoming County um, just last week. And we got no bids on it. 465 acres of great habitat work. There was 800 plus thousand feet of timber involved in it. But there was a lot of work cutting the undesirable, unmerchantable material. And when we contacted some of the big players, they said, well, you've got this big sale on Game Lands 12 and you've got this big one on Game Lands 13 coming. We want to buy one of them. Uh, we're going to pick the one that has the least amount of work and the most amount of grade lumber on it because we can't find the people to come out there and do all that excessive you know, work that we need done. So we're working some strategies among staff to try to maybe shift those operations away from commercial timber sales and put them into some non-commercial contracting um, so that maybe we can get ahead and, and, and do things a little different. So um, always challenges, but I think I've talked long enough, probably too long. So I'll stand for any questions if you have them. If not, um, always, I'm always available. Any questions?
Good morning. Uh, this morning I've been asked to cover four topics related to the deer management program. Uh, we'll brief uh, update on staff recommendations for the 2018-19 uh, deer hunting seasons. I'll go over a schedule for our deer management plan revision in the upcoming year. I'll also provide a brief update on our deer research program and then finish up talking about the role of antler restrictions and chronic wasting disease management. Staff are not recommending any changes from the 2017 deer hunting seasons for this year's upcoming seasons. And as is the standard schedule, antlers license allocations will be available once we have all the harvest and forest data available for this year. A major project for the deer program this year will be to revise our deer management plan. The current plan runs through fiscal year 2018. Our revision will begin with public input in the form of a deer hunter survey uh, that we uh, began last fall. Uh, data entry is uh, nearing an end here. Uh, this spring we'll have those data available. We're also looking at holding a stakeholder meeting, uh, bringing uh, different groups in from across the state uh, to gather input regarding the deer program from those folks. Our revision will begin once we have that public input and we'll work through the summertime on that. This fall then we will be conducting internal game commission reviews, looking for public comment uh, and review in the spring of 2019 and then having the plan finalized in time for fiscal year 19. Deer research is ongoing, ending and starting. Uh, earlier this month, we started four deer trapping crews throughout Pennsylvania working on a number of different projects. And if all goes well, this deer capture and release scene will be repeated hundreds of times this winter. The deer forest study continues on state forest. This study is a collaborative effort with DCNR's Bureau of Forestry, Pennsylvania Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit, and Penn State University. The objectives of this study are to evaluate deer impact measures that we use when making antlerless license allocation recommendations, to evaluate the effectiveness of DMAP, particularly on state forest lands, and that includes deer hunter activities and opinions on those lands, and to improve our understanding of the interactions of deer, soil, and vegetation. And I also want to take a moment to highlight an important communications tool that was created as part of this project, and that is the Deer Forest blog. Since we began the blog three years ago, more than 100 articles or more than 300 articles have been published, and over the course of a year, about 400,000 page views occur. As a result of this following, the blog has provided national exposure for the Game Commission's DEER program. Because of the people following the blog, we've been contacted for stories uh, from Smithsonian and Popular Science, and our posts have been shared on national hunting forums and websites, as well as podcasts and Twitter feeds. The fawn survival study will be ending in a few weeks. Uh, this study was added to our deer forest study on the Susquehannock, Bald Eagle, and Rothrock State Forest back in 2015. During the three field seasons, we captured 165 fawns. In December, one of the graduate students working on this project defended her thesis. Uh, she has one publication in review at the moment and will continue to work on another when the, uh, the data come in uh, from the 2017 fawns. And in the next month, all of our 2017 fawns will uh, make it through the 34 weeks since capture, at which point the study will end and we'll uh, move on to data analysis at that point. Deer and elk and wildlife health uh, personnel in collaboration with the South Central Region and Pennsylvania Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit are beginning a new study in DMA 2. And DMAs 2 and 3 are represented by the light colored areas on this map. The study area itself is within DMAP Unit 2874 in southern Blair and northern Bedford counties. Uh, this study uh, area is split by units 2C and 4A. And the study will investigate the question, can we control CWD? Uh, deer will be captured and marked with ear tags and GPS collars to monitor survival, harvest rates and movements, including dispersal of the young deer. The new field crews are in place, and so far they're reporting good cooperation with landowners who are providing sites for them to set up uh, nets to capture deer, and we expect to start trapping deer uh, on this study area later this week. When discussing agency responses to CWD, some suggest elimination of antler restrictions will help combat CWD. Based on data from Pennsylvania, 
and experiences from other states, we have not yet recommended the removal of antler point restrictions in CWD DMAs. First, we can look at Pennsylvania data. We know that removal of antler restrictions will not slow the spread of CWD due to buck dispersal. We also know that hunters like antler restrictions and effective CWD management will require hunter participation. Second, we can look at other states' experiences. Studies of CWD using data and computer models suggest Pennsylvania's antlered harvest should be adequate for CWD management. And in the next few slides, I'll go through each of these points uh, individually. In terms of CWD spread, antlered bucks disperse before hunters can stop them. As a result, changing antler point restrictions will not necessarily impact significantly the number of bucks dispersing. Based on research conducted in Pennsylvania, 50 to 70 percent of yearling bucks will disperse from where they were born. This line shows the cumulative dispersal frequency from January, when the bucks are about six months old, to 18 months of age in December. The bucks will start growing their first set of antlers in the spring, and dispersal will occur soon after. From April to July, we're looking at about 30 percent of dispersal taking place. Then after the first set of antlers harden in late summer, the remainder of the yearling buck dispersal will occur. On average, these bucks are moving about five miles from where they were born. The orange line represents the cumulative harvest of antler deer throughout the archery and firearm seasons. Archery harvest starts slow, pick up in late October, early November, and then with the firearm season, we see the proportion of the bucks being harvested increases significantly. In terms of timing, Dispersal is essentially completed when most of our antlered bucks are being harvested. And if reducing dispersal is the goal, the bucks need to be removed before they grow that first set of antlers, and that can only occur with an antlerless harvest. And I don't put it on this slide, but we also know that about 12% of our yearling does will disperse. Uh, on average, they're going to disperse twice as far as the bucks. We also know that about half of those yearling does will move outside of their home range uh, at some time during the fawning season, which on this map would correspond with May-June time period. Uh, those trips are about the same distance as an average buck dispersal. They'll go out about four miles, and then after a couple days, they will come back. But we see about half of our yearling does also moving miles outside their home ranges. From our work on dispersal of does, we have also uh, seen a trend where the lower the density, the lower you can expect female dispersal to be. Uh, bucks, on the other hand, their dispersal does not appear to be related at all to density. So young deer do disperse and can spread CWD, and to reduce that dispersal, the deer must be removed prior to that dispersal time period as part of an antlerless harvest. Changing the antlered harvest at this point, once they have antlers, would have little effect on dispersal. Socially, our hunters are satisfied with APRs. In our 2014 deer hunter survey, hunters supported antler restrictions by a three to one margin. Given this level of satisfaction with antler point restrictions, we as managers should have a good justification if we're going to make a change to antler point restrictions. For example, if we have good evidence that removing antler point restrictions will have a noticeable and positive effect on CWD management, then we would recommend such a change. At this point though, without the good evidence, we have not made that recommendation. We'll finish up looking at some of the information from other states. Based on the available information, removal of antler point restrictions likely will not have a significant effect on CWD. First, studies from other states suggest Pennsylvania's antler point restrictions can be effective for CWD management. This conclusion is based on harvest rates and the timing of the bulk of antler harvest. A recently published set of recommendations to address CWD from Western state agencies indicates that antlered harvest should be greater than 30% and occur after the rut. In Pennsylvania, our antlered harvest rates are greater than 30% and the bulk of our deer are harvested during the firearm season, which is after the rut. In another paper, our antlered harvest rates are close to a male-focused harvest strategy, and the male-focused harvest strategy provided the best CWD control over the course of a 50-year period. So based on these data and models from other states, it appears Pennsylvania's antlered harvest rates are adequate for CWD management. Second, even with antler restrictions, most of the deer left in the population post-hunt or after the hunting season are not antler deer. 
Yearling and adult males make up about 20% of the population after the hunting season. Adult females make up over half the population. Juveniles, the deer that will disperse before the next hunting season, make up about a quarter. As a result, if we removed every antler deer each year, we would still have more than 75% of the population capable of perpetuating and spreading CWD to new areas. This is likely one reason we see increased antler harvest and targeted removals appearing to be the most effective method of uh, managing CWD in other states. And given that APRs will not st stop buck dispersal and our antler harvest rates appear to be adequate, we are not making a recommendation to remove C uh, antler point restrictions in our DMAs. However, given the serious nature of CWD, we will continue our evaluations of antler point restrictions as new information becomes available. And with that, I'd be glad, glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Chris. Uh, really good information. Uh, any questions or comments from the commissioners? Ad adult males. Yes. Bucks. What's the, what are we seeing as far as prevalence of CWD in the <clears throat> research where, or the data we're getting back? In terms of prevalence, uh, I'm not sure exactly where the numbers are. Our prevalence rates are generally low. Uh, one of the things, and we've had this debate, Justin and I were actually uh, debating it yesterday via email, uh, in terms of prevalence and, and how to interpret the, that information. And one of the issues that came out in a recent paper uh, on white-tailed deer was the h harvest susceptibility of adult bucks with CWD. And in that particular study, bucks that had CWD were much more vulnerable to harvest. So if you're just going off your hunter harvest, you can't assume that that sample from the hunter harvest is necessarily representative of what's out there in the population right. because deer with CWD are being harvested at a higher rate potentially than deer without it. And the thought is, is there's something there with their, uh, the behavior uh, in terms of how alert they are, that type of thing. Uh, basically, that's theory hypotheses at this point. Uh, but prevalence rates with adult bucks, that's, it gets a little touchy in terms of, okay, what, what is that telling us about the population? In terms of looking or monitoring for CWD, uh, you know, that, in that case, that, that data can be helpful. Uh, it may be even more efficient. If those bucks are more vulnerable to harvest and you're using hunter harvested uh, samples, you know, looking at adult bucks may give you an earlier detection of CWD. Doesn't necessarily translate directly back to the population itself. Um, and in our, we also collect a lot of road kills, which a lot of states don't do. And in that, case we see a lot of positive proportion of positives are coming from yearling males and adult females so it's it's a mixed bag and like so many things with CWD there are no black and white I was gonna answers. say it's frustrating isn't it there's it's no extremely absolute answers yes. when it comes yeah. to CWD if you, if you like black and white and warm and fuzzy topics <laughs> let's no move on to CWD. something else <laughs> right yeah <clears throat> any other questions Good, Jim. Uh, I'm seeing some stuff Chris on some uh, research that shows there's like essentially subspecies um, within the deer population of Pennsylvania, maybe they're inhibited by movement over right. mountains or you know, whatever. And does that have any implications with CWD? Do we, do we find it any or more or less susceptible? In our view of it right now, based on what we know, uh, that could have potential in terms of maybe focusing our sampling efforts. For example, uh, bucks. When we've seen buck dispersal in the past, it has tended to follow ridges and valleys. So in this area in, in DMA2 where we have that ridge and valley component, uh, you know, our sampling efforts may be uh, you know, more efficient if we're sampling north of those valleys, type, up through the valleys. The problem is, is when we look at our doe dispersal, they just wander. They don't seem to be as influenced. So uh, the idea of subpopulations, if there was a strong genetic component where certain animals were, they're not technically, at least as far as I know, none of them are resistant to it. They, they just can carry it longer before it, it, it uh, kills them. Uh, it might have something, but I don't know that the dis differences between one subpopulation and another from that standpoint would be that dramatic. Uh, that it would be worth you know, us trying to alter our management according to it. I think that from the buck dispersal side, I mean, there's some information there that would be helpful. Uh, there's also some information there that's less than encouraging when you look to the south in Maryland and West Virginia, right. that ridge and valley runs right up to where we are now. So uh, we can probably expect that to be a continual movement of deer from the south up through that ridge and valley right, in Pennsylvania. Thanks. 
Thank you. Um, at this point, we're going to take a 10-minute break. <laughs>